Alors. Hi, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so thank you for coming and joining us in this evening and waiting for all our technical issues. Um, I s wanted to do this talk. Um, GraphQL is pretty old now, like it's been around for some time. But I recently started a job five months ago. And they gave me a list of technologies of things that I needed to learn. And GraphQL was one of them. Um, I did not to be fair, actually like look at the technology before starting the job. So um, when I was in the job, um, there's quite a lot of the services that they use, and they use GraphQL. So fumbled my way through, but decided that I needed to take some time. So as most presenters do, if you want to learn a new technology, prepare to talk about it. So that's what I'm doing. Um, my name is Rudy, and um, this is what I do. So the five the job that I got five months ago is uh, working at Tez. Tez is a UK-based company, so I get to work remotely. Yay. Um, really enjoy it. Um, and uh, the, it's basically a digital education company that has a single mission, which is um, a great teacher for every child. And a lot of the people that work there genuinely believe that. Um, and <laughs> genuinely because it's like false. But like um, they believe they, they believe in it and they pour their hearts into the work that they do, which is very exciting so having to work for that is pretty 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 cool if I'm not doing that I'm a facilitator slash mentor at Umuzi it's an organization that um, helps or provides young people with digital skills so that they can do some digital work um, and they try to bridge a gap between unemployment uh, well the bridge the gap in unemployment in South Africa so it's pretty awesome and if I'm not doing that I run an organization called Pink IT um, with amazing humans who help me each and every single day to get a lot of women into software development um, and I understand that this is what I do and who I and not who I am so um, that's not interesting um, the only thing that I discovered about myself just this weekend is that I love cake and just like <laughs> just like every other person who's in South Africa that lives Papa and Umkhodu, right? I really love cake as in like traveling at a petrol station with the wool where it's kind of I love cake so that was something I discovered by myself that was new all right, so what is GraphQL? All right, so I, I, as, as I learned the technology, right, obviously you want to find definitions about um, what it is and what people consider it to be and things that are fun. So apologies, my presentations are not as structured as Nika's one, and I have been doing this for some time now, so I'm sorry. Um, first thing is that it was founded at Facebook. So Facebook has quite a lot of systems, I'm sure, and services and stuff like that, and so they decided to create this specification called GraphQL. So my specification is a set of requirements that you need to meet so that you can achieve something, right? And I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. But it's also a query language. So in query language, I think SQL and things like that. So you use queries to achieve these sets of requirements. So I'm like, okay, that's cool. It's also flexible, or in its definition, has the concept of flexibility. And what that means, well, after discovering it and reading stuff, is that it's actually from a front-end perspective, right? You are given the single endpoint, and you can call and provide, oh, like certain uh, responses that you want in the single um, like query, right? So the flexibility comes from there. But they have a strict type system. So I'm like flexible, but they have a strict type system. I'm like, okay. Um, and this is like they are schema definition language, and it serves as a contract between the client and the server. So you provide types like, uh, what is this, queries, mutations, um, subscriptions, and things like that. And this serves as a contract to your front-end developer so that they can code against the server. Right? Um, and uh, like contrary to popular belief, the graph part of GraphQL doesn't actually mean that it's associated to any graph, right? It talks about how it crawls an API from the, sub -di the, directory, the fields and subfields of that API to find out information and f or like resolve the fields. And the query part is the query language or the QL part is the query language. All right, so that's the definition of what gra gra GraphQL um, is and I hope that makes sense. All right, so in South Africa, right, we have been working with SOAP for some time. So anyone who's worked in the bank knows that SOAP hasn't died yet. And we have, um, um, uh, yeah, you know, and now we're moving to um, REST, and a lot of our services use REST, and we're pretty excited about it, but we're still using SOAP. So now we've got this new thing that's coming up called GraphQL, and I'm like, are we trying to maybe make REST obsolete? I don't think so. 
Um, and the nicest thing about GraphQL is that you can build it on top of any REST API. Um, and maybe it is trying to replace REST. I don't know. But with a show of hands, who um, actually has worked with GraphQL? And ah, and OK. So you guys know what GraphQL is. It's really exciting. All right, cool. Now let's take an example. All right, uh, we have a post in Instagram, I follow Cosmopolitan South Africa, and they've got this uh, post that comes from um, this, this girl's page, uh, the Ebony, no, ladies or woman's page, the Ebony Falcon, right? And that comes from Twitter. And then at the bottom here, we can see some likes, some comments, we're very familiar with Instagram, right? So take, go with me, with, with me in this journey, right? I would assume, for example, that some of these images that Cosmopolitan has stored lives in some type of database somewhere, right? And if we are bad at this as much as we are, um, co uh, like comments and likes might be living in a Redis or RabbitMQ store somewhere, right? And then we might have the em emoji kind of application that uh, Instagram doesn't have inherently, so they use like a third API to actually get like emojis onto their, um, their app. So in order for this kind of picture in my feed to show up on Instagram, multiple things need to be contacted. The service, the Redis um, store, um, what is this? Some third API and other services that they might have to make it possible. This is really daunting for some of our applications Maybe a website might have a lot of like network and bandwidth, but for mobiles, data is not cheap, right? And things die out. So the idea is that we can provide one endpoint and then make these calls and requests and then bring only the necessary information to the user. And this is what GraphQL tries to do. All right, so a REST version of what we just saw to make that Instagram post possible, right? Is we've got our, um, our desktop and our mobile. We go and get information from Redis. We go and get in information from per, um, Postgres and some other API. And like API, this world could be intense. Like it could be other services on top of other services just to get the information that we need, right? This is a GraphQL version of it. It says, all your applications, so your desktop and your um, uh, mobile, will only have one endpoint. And when you reach that, and in that endpoint, you can provide a certain schema of the data that you want every single time you call this endpoint. All right? GraphQL sits somewhere in your server somewhere, and then does all these calls for you, and resolves all this information and gives it back to you when you request it. Does that make sense? Awesome. Now, the things that uh, GraphQL tries to achieve or tries to solve is the concept of over and under fetching, right? So with our REST APIs, and I don't know how many of you guys have had this experience, right? You have a, um, a REST API that is probably developed according to like a schema that is in the back, uh, back end somewhere, and it just gives you information that you don't necessarily need at that particular time. You might just want the user's name, but not necessarily their address or things like that. Um, and so that's the overfetching part. The underfetching thing is, is that you might want more information, but this REST API only provides you like a, a bit of the information that you require. So you now need to make another call to get the rest of the information and things like that. So because in GraphQL you can like structure your, um, your response or what you want from this um, endpoint, you can tell it what you need and what you don't need. All right, it tries to solve the N plus one problem. What is that? Now, for a query to happen like that post that we just did, right? Um, the comment from Instagram. Let's say you are fetching the, the content, and for each and every one of those content, there's comments. And in those comments, there's names of users, right? If you just fetch the information, you are going to get the information about Cosmopolitan as um, a user in Instagram. You're gonna fetch all the comments that is required for the, like, that are part of this post. But for each and every one of those comments, you need to go do a fetch to get the information about the user who posted the comment. This is a lot of trips to your server, and it, it's pretty much expensive and you don't necessarily want to do that. Facebook came, across, came with the concept of data loader. And this is basically um, using batching and caching to kind of help you in, 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 in um, making your request. So batching, it goes and gets all the information that you need from your services, right? And tries to cache this information for you so that the next time you want to make a similar trip, it already has that information for you. All right. 
it has charts and analytics, right? And why do you need to have this? Is that sometimes a resolver, for example, that resolves your field in, your, in, in the query language. You want to find out whether some things are taking longer, um, shorter, and try to uh, help or like mitigate those bottleneck, bottlenecks. So GraphQL gives you like these nice graphs and analytics tool to make that possible. Um, another thing is that because we change so many things in the front end, right, it's easier for you to make those iterations because you just control like, your res the response that you want from your API. So next moment in your, um, your front end, you have a field of an address. Next time you don't, and all you need to do is just remove the address from the request in the endpoint. What is also nice is that after a long time, if ever you've like designed something and it's no longer used, it will tell you that that thing is not used anymore, so you can remove it without having any issues or any breakage in your current front end. Right, and also the SDL part, which is the schema definition language. Right, it provides you a contract with your client, with the client between the client and the server. So all the front-end developers can continue with their work without having to worry about what's happening in the back-end. And when the back-end is ready, it's just plug and play. So that's pretty cool. Right. So I know I talk a lot, and I'm quite tired. So if you guys want to take anything out of this talk, it's pretty much these five things. And I'm going to cover GraphQL from a very high level, right? One of them is the schema. Right, uh, that we talked about, which is the contract that we're going to walk through, and I'm going to explain how it looks like. Um, a resolver, right? Number three, it's queries, mutations, and subscriptions. We are going to talk about each and every one of them in detail and how they look like, but just look at this and like memorize it, capture it. Okay. The schema. Right, I like this quote as I was going through um, Medium. Um, I went through a really other cool websites like how to graph QL and things like that. And they say this, or like, yeah, design your schema based on how data is used, not based on how it's stored, which is the issue that I explained a little bit earlier on about underfetching and overfetching, for example. If you know that you're going to need this information, and, and people might not favor this concept, right? Uh, but you have the ability to. Um, do this and like be more efficient in how you actually query information into your uh, from your server. Another thing that I forgot to mention is that REST is not a bad um, protocol specification, right? Because we have smart developers out there and a lot of people have found certain ways of dealing with some of the issues that I mentioned, which is overfetching and underfetching, right? Um, or like other issues that I mentioned. Like we have OData, if you really, really want to use a query language that, you can, that is built on top of REST. Um, we've got JSON schema, if you really want to use a schema for your REST API. So it's not that you have to use GraphQL. People have found solutions to still use REST with different types of other tools that sit on top of REST, right? Just as an FYI, right? Schema, right? The second part is our resolvers. A resolver is a function in GraphQL server that is responsible for fetching a data for a single field. This is very important, right? Um, so this is the field that we have, quotes, right? And this is our resolver. So our resolver will do all the magic that it needs to, to do. Remember, GraphQL needs to like go and fetch information there and go fetch information there and get fetch information there to make one field possible, right? So your resolvers are basically in the, the instructions and the soldiers that you send in to go and get that information for you. So you will provide your functions, your methods, and everything that you want to do here to resolve whatever field that is being queried. Does that make sense? All right. Queries. So each and everything that you have to do, that you use, like that, it has it has to be available in, into your contract or your schema. So this is a definition of how you would use. You will define a query inside your schema. Type query and whatever the query is. For example, here we've got quotes. We're going to see this in detail. Um, and quotes actually returns array of quotes. And quotes is just an object that bring that returns a message and an author and an ID. All right. So now in your resolver, you go to that query and say, hey, this is the quote that this is the query that someone is going to use. And they're gonna call quotes when they call this query. Go and get me all the quotes. And quotes could be a database, code could be a data, um, like a data store, an object, or anything that you want it to be. All right, and how do you use this? This is the usage. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so you would give it the keyword which is query and what you want uh, which uh, query that you actually want to query because there could be a list of queries um, 
and then um, in there you provide the information that you need so the fields that you want it to respond you with, with with right and I'll give you an example as well so if you only want the messages you can just put messages and it will return messages back if you want messages and author then you can provide these two fields and it will give those fields back to you right the third thing is fourth thing mutations this is how you would define your, your, your mutations inside your schema. So type mutation and whatever the mutation is. Yes, and you guessed it, mutation, it changes data. So if you want to add anything into your database or things like that, you will use this. Uh, you can, if you want to provide some fields, you will provide fields like this and give it type. It uses exclamation marks to say that this thing is required. So when you create your mutation, you have to provide um, a string value of message and, a, and an author value of string because these things are required. How would you use it? Usage. Uh, you provide the keyword which is mutation and which mutation you're actually interested in, um, the required field and the response that you want to have back after you have mutated something. The last thing, subscriptions. Subscriptions are things that you use to like monitor if an event has happened and when that event happens you want to know about it so you subscribe to it again there's other technologies that you can do to achieve the same thing but graphql also provides this for you um, you'll define a subscription like this the type which is subscription and it as uh, and we know that it's strictly typed this is how you need to always specify your schema and the resolver this is how a subscription resolver would look like so we've got subscription and uh, PubSub is a published subscription factory that Apollo provides for you. Um, and then the async iterator is basically a function that asynchronously listens to your event, your events, whatever event that is, that is, that it is. All right. So yeah, this is the last part, which is subscriptions. In this journey of uh, figuring out what GraphQL is, um, I know I, I found out that it was made open source in 2015, but this website is pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. Reason being is that, okay, so you'll go through all the theory before you get to this part, but it shows you what kind of technologies that it works with from the front end and then other technologies that it works with in the back end. And there's a lot of information, like in GraphQL and Node alone, there is like, uh, Graph.js that was created by Facebook. Um, Graph Yoga that is built on top of Express. Um, Apollo, which is the one that we're using, and the reason why I chose Apollo is because the company that I work for uses it. So I needed to learn these technologies. So this is what I'm doing. Um, and yeah, so if you want to check anything out, go to this website. Pretty awesome. So yeah, let's jump into our demo. I'm not brave like Nico, so I'm not going to really code live. I'm not going to test the demo gods like that. All right, what, let's do this. Okay. So we're gonna start on the server. Uh, nope. Everyone can see that, right? Everyone good? All right, you can't see, can't see, sorry. Is that better? Awesome, okay, so my server is pretty simple. All right, um, you've got all your node modules that are installed, but I'm going to first pay attention to our package.json. There's pretty much two dependencies, right? Yes, this is going to go and get other dependencies in your node module, be gigantic, but these are the two things that are important that you need just to get a server run up and running, right? Um, Apollo data source REST. I still do believe that I can do this with request from Node. Try to do it, took me long, so I just like bail out. Um, <laughs> And then um, a Polo server, which we're gonna go and talk about now. All right, this is my server. All right, I import all the libraries, libraries and factors that I'm gonna use, and this is my schema. All right, schema, you have to use GraphQL, which comes from uh, the Apollo server. This also provided a lot of like complexity for me because like they removed GraphQL from Apollo, Apollo client and now you needed to go and get it in graph text. But yeah, I'm just like, all right. So yes, you provide GraphQL and provide the schema. Inside the schema, this is how you would use your comments instead of like forward slashes or like forward slash and a star, um, you use hashtags. And this is my first type. I've got a type called quotes. Right, that takes in, or oh, that has um, an ID, a message, and an author. My, I've got a query. Uh, that quer the first query is uh, quotes that returns an array of quotes, so it'll bring back this, like an array of these. 
All right? And then I've got Best Quotes, which is a third party library that I imported into my application so I can show you how you can, in one single GraphQL, be able to go get information from a different source and get information from another different source. And all of this just works in your schema. All right? So that's my query. My mutation is create a query where I pass in a message and the author. And then I've got a subscription so that when something happens, uh, when a, a query is being created, I want to be notified of it. All right? And then um, in order for me to, to use this third API, it was very, very, very complex because the data that they return is very, very complex. Um, and I've got it somewhere. No, I removed it because I restarted this. That's fine. OK. So that's my, OK. And then the, the third party. Um, what um, API brings back content, and content is a content type, which is an object. That object takes in uh, quotes and uh, copyright, because yes, it's not mine, um, and that brings in an array of random quotes. Random quotes is an object that takes in quotes and all of these things, and this is how basically you build your structure. So if ever you find a, a, an API that, that returns this gigantic information, this is how you would define it in your um, schema. Does that make sense? Does everything all right, cool. So we've got our schema on lockdown. That's number one. All right, so I've got a UID generator here because I needed to generate my IDs. I've got, yes, so this is my quote, which is just an array of objects. Um, it could be a database. It could be anything, but like, who's got the time? Um, and then the second thing is resolvers. Resolvers, you've got your query. We've seen this. Um, I resolve the, qu the quotes, which basically brings back this data um, array object that you see over here. And then the best quote, which is going to go um, into uh, best quotes API, use the API that I've got over here, and then return back some information. All right, so that's the second query that I have. In my subscriptions, I've got the subscriber, which is called quote added. Uh, let's go to my subscription here. You can see that quote added is actually the thing that I provided into my schema. Right, and then that will return a pop sub a async um, iteration that uses this. So this is just a label. It could be like um, a string of some sort, which here it's actually a string. But yeah, you can pass it a label so that you know which subscription that is actually being generated. And then my mutation. Right, in a mutation, this this is how resolvers work. You have a parent class. Um, Arguments, uh, so parent, which resolves the actual um, um, calling function, which is a mutation. Uh, arguments, whatever arguments that you're passing in. The context, which is shared across all, um, um, what is this, queries in uh, GraphQL and information, which provides the status of that resolver. All right. So right here, I'm just taking in arguments, whatever arguments, which would be message and author, and returning that back. Um, here, I'm pushing it into my data that we saw at the top, which is just an array of objects. And here, I'm calling my subscription so that it tells me that, hey, your data has been created. All right. OK, cool. So and this here, I create my server. So Apollo server, you provide the definition, which is the schema. If we go up here, it's the dude over there. And then your resolvers and your data sources. I need my data sources to resolve my third API. All right. And here I just launch my server. So if you see in my um, terminal, obviously that you're not going to see. But believe me when I say I started it at uh, port 4000 for everybody who's at the back. All right. And if we go here, we can see the server live. All right. So let's go. Query. Remember, when we want to specify our query from the, the front end, we need to provide the keyword, which is query. We need to provide whatever query that we want, what we're interested in, in this case, quotes. And I want you to return messages. So this is going to return an array of messages. And in it, it'll have message and it'll have author. If I'm not interested in the author, I can just remove this and call this function again. And it will only return messages to me. So you understand how this is like glorious and gold for all front-end developers. Like when I don't want information, I can just remove it from my query. And when I want it, I add it back. And then magically or automatically, it comes back to me. All right. Um, second one is I'd like to mutate some stuff. Um, sorry. That is also dark. Can everyone see? Sorry. Wider. Oh, yeah, no, I don't know if I can do that here, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry. Can I? Um, let's try that. Okay, theme, dark. Can we just say light? 
save the thing. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. Lovely. Thanks, guys. Um, so there you go. You've got a mutation. So you provide the keyword, which is mutation. In there, you create a quote. Uh, well, the mutation that you want, which is create quotes, and provide the information that is required, which is the message and the author, which are both type string. If I go and mutate this data, um, I've got my ID returned back and the author wishes roots, right? But we have another thing that we've got up our sleeve, which is a subscription. So I can start the subscription, and then it tells you that it's listening, right? Because it's going to run in the background and it's waiting for an event to happen. If I go back here and I change my message to fun times, and test and then run this again and go back to my quote you can see that it has returned a message because and the message of the things that that i've just put in on the last time because i told it it needs to return a message so now this thing is going to listen to any creation of um of my quotes and then tell me that okay hey a new quote has been created and this is the message that this person has put in which i think is super cool but okay um all right so I created this nice API with so many nice colors for you guys to um, see. And now we're going to consume our GraphQL in our client side. Yeah, so we're done with the server because like we're badass. Sorry, can I say that? All right. And this is our client. All right. Um, first thing that we're interested in is our query string. Remember, we have a query that is called quotes and quotes returns an array of uh, quotes. Um, in the front end, I need libraries that, okay, cool. So also a point of contention because people might feel a little bit different about this. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I used React um, because also the company that I work for uses React. So I work with React a lot every single day. So I also needed to learn how to do this in React. Um, that's the first part. The second part is that I really do not want to do this without a web framework because I also, I'm not sure if it's possible and I really didn't want the headache. So I just like plug and play. And that's my excuse. All right. Um, and I used hooks. <laughs> and a lot of people do um, functional components and keeping them clean and don't want to mix state with um, components. Yes, I understand. I believe that is wise. But this is a little bit clean um, for, for me, nonetheless. And uh, there's multiple things that you can use if you don't want to use um, React hooks, like queries and tags. So Apollo provides like query tags if you want to use queries. So you don't necessarily have to use uh, the hook that they have. And if you don't want to use that, there's also like high order components that you can use and it really decouples your GraphQL uh, requests um, and you can use that. So that's like the three options that I found and maybe there's more. Um, so yeah, this is how you would define your schema in your front end. So now we're in the front end, our, my, our brains and minds are in the front end. You provide the, um, the quotes that you need, uh, what the query that you're interested in, in this case it's quotes, and the information that you want back, all right? If you call use query, again, it's a, a, a hook that um, Apollo provides for us. Um, it will give you this information, which is the loading information, which is a Boolean value, the true or false. So when it's done, it's um, false. And then when it's still doing, it's true. Um, and then an error message. So this is also another problem with GraphQL is that unlike traditional REST APIs, it does not return like um, statuses that we know, like your 400s and whatever. When you request a, a, a request in GraphQL, it'll give you a 200, but it will give you an error object inside of it. And that will give you some details of what that error is. And maybe that's not so nice, <laughs> but like, um, yeah, it's an option. All right, so er er error, if that has resolved nicely, you get uh, all your data back. And in here, I'm just like pulling in the data into this nice UI because I'm like dope with UI. Um, and this is the quotes that you see all here at the bottom. So obviously my favorite one is like work hard, get paid, buy KFC, open it in a taxi so that everyone can smell your success. Because <laughs> um, it's so great. Right, and if someone is already shopping for Christmas for me, right, my size is window seats in plane ticket sizes. So yeah, <laughs> right, so we've got that, um, and we've got our query, and we've got magic happening in the front end. If you want to do or add something, right, so this is how you would specify your mutation into your front end. Again, Q, uh, the query uh, keyword, um, you, you, this is just basically like what you want to name the, the, the mutation that you want. 
again, this is our creation mutation, and you provide it the fields that you need. So in this case, a string, this, okay, let me just go here, no, let's see. Uh, we've called it something else. All right, so yeah, and um, it will take in, again, message and author, and this is what you pass into query. We've already seen this in our GraphQL, right? But that's basically how you would use it. And in add quotes, another hook that Apollo gives us, which is use mutation, and all you need to do is just call the, the mutation that you need. It will give you whatever crea creation quote that you are looking for, or in this case, hey, go and call creation query with the data, all right? Um, here, I did some funky stuff because I use, use state to go and get information from, <laughs> from um, um, the front end. And this is basically this piece that you see at the top here. So I can say, um, fun times again, and in here, go Rudy, and then add that. So you don't see anything at the bottom, but if I refresh my screen, you now see fun times Rudy, all right? And this is basically done here. So those two, um, what is this, text boxes are here. I set message from you state and I set author, right? And those fields are set. And then I've got a function that I call called add new quote. And in here, I take in the variables that I need, which is message and author from the use state, and then that calls our quotes and everything happens, All right? And yeah, the third part would be subscriptions. Subscriptions in the front end, um, again, provide the keyword subscription, what kind of subscription I want, and the information that will be returned in the subscription when magic has happened. And I see now I've got a console log that has got test, so let's remove that. Uh, and then, yeah, um, in there you've got another, um, what is this hook that Apollo provides us called use subscription. You call the subscription with loading and the data that it resolves to, right? And yeah, so this is how my application work. And yeah, this is my two cents about GraphQL. So yeah, thank you guys. Any questions? <laughs>